welcome to our new show, Collins World of Everything. Now today we've come to a viaduct on A1. You know, thousands and thousands of people use this viaduct in West Yorkshire daily and they don't even realise what they're actually going over. So today what we've decided to do on Collins the Edge World of Everything is come to Wembridge Viaduct in Pontefract, near Pontefract, to show your people who are using this viaduct every day what this viaduct's all about. The viaduct itself is on the Great North Walk Road, otherwise known as the A1, and it's a north-south artery. Probably one of the busiest roads in the country, and it moves north to south from Scotland down to London. Right, just a little bit about the viaduct. It opened in 1961. And in 1998, the actual viaduct became a Grade 2 listed building. And it also won an award from the Concrete Society. When it was first built, that Webridge Viaduct, it was the only viaduct of its kind in the world. So it was a world first. This viaduct to Webridge near Pontefract was a world first. And it's still here today being used by cars every day. It was also the largest viaduct in Europe during construction. High tensity cables were used that strung it across this valley. This is the valley, this is the Went Valley below us, as you can see. If you look down there, you, know, you can see River Went. And obviously, all these motorists that are just flying by me don't realise how much engineering went into building this viaduct. It's a concrete viaduct. The reason for the Wentbridge Viaduct is to cross the River Went and the Went Valley. Now the River Went itself, just a few facts about the River Went, it rises at Street House. It obviously goes through Ackworth, Nostal Priory, Ackworth, and then obviously it goes through Wentbridge, down the Went Valley, and eventually spills out into the River Don. So this is the River Went. Here we are now, we're at the bottom of the valley. We're at the bottom of Went Valley here in Wentbridge. And as you can see behind me, this is the Wentbridge Viaduct. Now, a lot of people just drive over it all the time, right? And they don't really know what they're actually driving over. But if you look at the size of this large, vast valley we're in, uh, it's really, to be fair, the actual viaduct it's sent, it's a part of his motorway heritage. I mean, as you can see, these, these two large stanchions that come down at either side of the viaduct to support it middle of the viaduct. And the actual viaduct itself, there were actually high tensity cables that were actually drooped across the valley to support the actual viaduct itself. Like I've already mentioned earlier on, uh, it, when it was built, this viaduct, it was the first viaduct of its kind in the world, so it was world first back in 1961. So that really, to be fair, it makes it part of our motorway heritage. You know, it was, it was a, a world first and it was built here at Wentbridge. Oh, I mean, how can you believe it? This motorway bridge is a grade two listed building. And it's just, a, it's, and it's a modern structure, really. It's not like it's an old tumbling down wreck. You know, it, it, it's a motorway bridge and it's still being used to this day. The majority of people who are using A1 don't even know they're going over it. They're over it in, in two seconds. That's all it takes. Two seconds to drive over that, over that, over that viaduct. As you can see, there's a walkway that runs all the way underneath. It's like, a, it's like a little gangplank carriageway. That actually takes you up onto the carriageway itself. It's obviously for inspection purposes and maintenance purposes. It's, it's gated off at both sides at Valley. You can't get down there. Public cannot get access to that walkway. And that runs all the way underneath the actual carriageway and it runs right to the other side of the valley. You know what I mean? So it's, it, it, it's quite an intriguing piece of engineering, really. You know, and he's just sat here. So we're here at Webridge Viaduct, we can hear traffic thundering above his heads. And we're just inside one of these concrete buttresses, stanchions, whatever you want to call it. And look at look up width of them. Look how wide they are. No wonder Concrete Society get it on a ward. I mean, it's just absolutely colossal. I know it's only a motorway bridge, but never mind. But hey, it's it's here. It's still serving its purpose. We've run out of things to say about Wentbridge Viaduct now. I'm just going to go somewhere else. So what we're going to do now, we're going to move on to our next item in the show. I'll see you there soon. Calling the edge world of everything.
Welcome back to Colin the Ed's World of Everything. Wind turbine, very controversial issue. Are they just absolute eyesores that are littering our countryside? Or are they actual cheap source of electricity? We've come to the Hampole Wind Farm near Doncaster to come and look at these wind turbines to see, to make your decision. You know, are they an eyesore or are they an eyesore? And there might be a few facts along the way. The Humble Coal Fired Power Station is there in the distance. That's Drax over there. Now we're currently, that's, that's times gone by and that's the way we used to generate electricity and that was the only way we used to generate electricity here in England. But what we're starting to find now is we've got structures like this here, like this massive wind turbine that's just sat on this hillside making free, pollution free electricity. Right, round here, these wind turbines have just been newly constructed. You know, they've just they've only just been built and they're, they're a new feature to the countryside round here. And from where I come, they're a bit of a controversial view. Now, it's not a windy day today, to be fair, right? And these wind turbines, as you can see, they're just spinning. You know, they're making electricity. The electricity that these wind turbines are producing has been fed straight into the national grid. Right, so if you just look above me, we just, we just have a look above it, we just stood underneath this wind turbine. We just stood underneath it. And it's absolutely massive. It's huge. Got to have at least 200 feet. Each blade's got to be at least 100 foot. So, we're currently at Ampole Wind Farm. Now, there's also another wind farm in this area and they actually are on the same hill line. They're like a banker hill, there's a hill bank and they're, they're roughly at the same altitude. So if you look behind me, here, there's another wind farm now, that's Barnborough Wind Farm. Obviously we're at Ampole Wind Farm, but that's Barnborough Wind Farm over there. Now, what it is with these wind turbines is, is they've all got their own substation. They've all got their own substation, which in the substation is nearby. You know, that over there, See that building down there? That's the substation. So obviously all the electricity that these four wind turbines are producing is being fed to that substation, obviously down a wire, and then being fed into the national grid. Now, whoever uses this electricity, it'll just be it'll just be pumped into the national grid and just get used like normal electricity. You wouldn't even know you were using electricity that come from a wind farm. But there's a little Sometimes what you notice with, uh, with wind turbines, especially wind farms, is there might only be one spinning round and all the rest have been shut down. Now, wind turbines are a little bit intelligent because really, what it is is they cannot store the electricity. Wind farms haven't got big batteries, right, to store all electric that they use, right? As soon as the electric's produced at the turbine and fed into the substation, it's got to go into the grid. Now, people probably think, well, why aren't they just turned on all the time? It's free energy. But think about it. If it were just turned on all the time and these wind turbines were just rotating and going round and round and round, obviously that'll put more wear and tear on the turbine. And if there isn't a demand for it, where's the electricity going to go? Some days you'll go by and it'll be a really windy day and there'll only be one turbine going. And people think, well, it's very right windy, let's get wind turbines going. But, you know, because there's no need for the actual electricity to be used, they might, on a windy day, they might have just one turbine in operation. And then another day you might go driving by wind turbine, there's hardly no wind, like today. There's not much wind in air. It's not, a, it's not a windy day at all, really, to be fair. In fact, there's hardly any wind at all. But all four turbines are in operation, so that tells me that the national grid has got a demand for electricity that your big power stations can't provide, such as Egbra, Drax, Ferry Bridge, your big three round there. They're your big three power stations round here, right? So what's happening here is these four turbines have been turned on, right, to pick up the slack, basically, so to relieve strain on, obviously, the coal-fired fire power stations. It's just free electricity. That's the reason why they don't always use them. Plus another thing as well, it's wear and tear on turbine. So that's just that's just a few facts on wind turbines. Now, 
we just have a look up a bit of footage at wind turbine going round you know the, the the big things these the massive they've got to be, it's got to be 200 foot tall it's got to be 200 foot tall we each we each blade 100 foot you know and they are the, the massive and you can hear you can hear wind catching sails as they go around free electricity people do moan about them people complain we don't want to win farm we don't want to win farm but really to fair what else would you be doing around here by growing crops you know what i mean so i think personally calling the ed's opinion on a wind farm is i think there are eight you know i think you know we're looking for greener greener alternative energy solutions and we've got it we've got it here at ampol wind farm we've got the future of britain's electricity right here and it's happening right now as we speak this is ampol wind farm i'm calling the ed this is Colin the Ed's world of everything. Hey, wind's actually picked up while we're here. And you can actually hear a turbine working inside, inside actual tower at, wind, at windmill. And me, me and cameraman here, we've just commented on how much more noise it's making. It's up. Can you hear it? Now wind's picked up, it's flying ram. That's mad, that. Wind energy is local energy, right? And here is a prime example. Above me, we've got some, uh, we've got some sub electricity lines. Obviously, if you look above me, these are uh, these electricity pylons here. Obviously, wooden wooden posts. Uh, these are local electricity lines. So after, after it's come from the transmission line from the power station, what happens is the, the, the electricity gets downgraded into what's called these sub lines. Now the wind farm, this this line of pylons at side of me runs parallel to wind farm. Now obviously at this side here we've got the substation. This is where the actual wind turbines. This is where the all electricity comes from the wind turbines. Now, if you look at the pylon behind me, we've got three feeders that are feeding into the actual grid, onto the actual power lines ascent. Now, this is where the actual wind energy is meeting the national grid, and it's being fed in on that pylon, that gantry behind me. Well, in front of me, should I say. So, this is a prime example to demonstrate how local wind energy created from wind turbines is feeding the local area because these will go to lo these power lines will feed local villages such as south emsel carcroft red house probably upton uh, and obviously it's skelet scalebrook you know and obviously in that direction we've got ickleton pickburn uh ampole obviously ampole wind farm so the actual energy that's being produced by these four wind turbines is local energy produced here on your doorstep calling the edge world of everything yeah just cut me one we want i'm bothered how about love i'm easy i'm easy love Oh, you want? Cook all you want tonight. Surprise me. All right, love. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. All right then. I'll see you later. See you later. Bye. 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 We take them for granted, don't we? This little phone, this little tiny little device, we run as lives by them. But we take them for granted. They're just there all the time, aren't they? these phones now we use them every day they're every day part of those lives right but what actually makes them work obviously this little phone can't generate enough rf energy or signal to get all the way around world i mean you can be you can be in spain and make a phone call on a mobile phone to somebody in england how does it work you know today in our days we've got 4g we've got internet we've got We've got cellular communication, text messaging. We've got, we've got basically we've got the full internet on the mobile phone on this plateau, right? If it weren't for these structures behind us, these towers, this would not be possible. 
Nah. People complain about them. Very controversial. I mean, if it, I mean, when they put a sell your sell your phone mast up in playground at school, everyone's moaning. Oh, they're building a they're building a mobile phone mast in me in me uh, in my school, and I'm not very happy about it. But it's them mams that are complaining. But when they want to sit down for the cup of coffee, when kids are in in school playing, right, and they go, oh well, we'll just uh, we'll just go on internet, a bit of Facebook. It's these towers that are making it possible. It's these these mobile phone masts that are making it possible. They're dotted all over the country, and you'll see them at side at motorway when you're going up and down, and people complain about them. But if it weren't for them. These would not work. It would not be possible to have your internet and all the rest of it that goes with today's modern mobile phone, right? Without these towers. It's all about data now, day, data, data transmission. Obviously, over the last 10 years, we've seen mobile communications such as this Galaxy S4, you know, coming on in leaps and bounds. I mean, 10 years, you'd have never even dreamed of being able to go shopping on your mobile phone, for instance. And it's these that are making it possible. So, how does it work? I can hear you screaming this question at me. How does it all work, Colin? Well, I'm going to tell you. See, do you see the disc behind me that's mounted halfway up the actual... In fact, there's three. There's three discs all mounted on the actual mast itself. Now, these are called trows. They're called trows. And their job is, is they're lined up with other trows on other mobile phone mast so their job is to move your call to another mobile phone mast so that's the trows and obviously you can see the trows and they're all pointed in different directions and they'll all be lined up with other mobile phone masts now at the top of the mast obviously the higher part of the mast we've got these like oblong like rectangular shapes and they're pointing in different directions now, these are the antennas, and their job, receive the call and send it to the trowel. So if you're making a call around here, the antennas at the top will receive your call and send it to the trowel, and then send it to another mobile phone mast for obviously processing again at the other mobile phone mast, and so on and so on and so on. Every community will have a mobile phone mast. And obviously, the phones in the area has got enough enough power to reach the mobile phone mast now once the signals reach the mobile phone mast then it's up to the mobile phone mast to do its job now the mobile phone all it is is an amplification tool and it beams signals in different directions so different mobile phone masts will talk to other mobile phone masts in the area so your signals left the phone it's gone to the mobile phone mast the mobile phone mast has transmitted it to the next mobile phone mast, then that mobile phone mast will transmit it to the next mobile phone mast until the call, text message, piece of data has reached where it needs to get. Now, if it has to go down a line, i.e. the internet, it'll get transferred to a line. But mobile phones talk to mobile phones through mobile phone masts. So these towers, whether you like them or not, are the backbone of Britain's mobile communication system. And really, to be fair, everybody's got one. Everybody uses them. And if it weren't for these towers, this would not be possible. For all these people that moan about mobile phone towers, right? Next time you sat, right, doing a text, right, think about the humble mobile phone tower, right? If you complain about them, don't use a mobile phone. Calling the egg world of everything. We all complain when we get a runny nose, a cough or a cold. But can you imagine having plague? Eubonic plague, right? You'd have had pussy, pussy scabs all over your face and they'd have been pussy and they'd have been horrible. And you'd have had an handkerchief over your face. You know what I mean? Filled with herbs and other remedies that were supposed to get rid of plague. Generally, you'd have felt unwell in your sand. You'd have felt really poorly. Probably bedridden. Uh, and all these attempts, all these attempts were in vain. You know, these, these remedies, they were, they were useless. They, they just didn't even work. You know what I mean? 
So all these people died because of this terrible disease. They died because of this lane. And there were no cure for it. There were no cure. They were killing thousands and thousands of people. You know, it was right. What we've decided to do is come to Aqua Plague Stone. It's a great two listed monument, right? And what it is, is, is back in 1645, right, when the plague were about, what the people of Aqua decided to do is put this here stone in. Now, I walk up to this stone, it's full of water. But back in 1600s, what they'd have done is they filled that stone with vinegar. Back in the day in 1645, vinegar was seen as the best disinfectant art. They were no better than sterilising stuff with, with vinegar. So they used to fill it with vinegar. Now, when they were doing trading with the local town of Pontefract, to stop the spread of the plague, what the people of Aquas did is, the money would get dropped in vinegar. Obviously, vinegar cleaned things. It's a natural cleaning, it's an acid. So it was the best disinfectant, or they thought it was the best disinfectant at the time, to clean the money. So if the money had plague on it, or was infected money, it would get cleaned. And then, then what would happen is then, the person would take the money out of the vinegar, and then obviously put it in his pocket. I don't know what they used to do with money back in them days, or just do what they want with the money. But the whole idea of the plague stone was to stop the spread of plague. Now, the actual plague victims are buried in a burial site to my right here. Here we have a plaque, and it actually says Aqua Plague Stone, associated with the outbreak of plague in 1645. The hollow was intended to hold vinegar to disinfect the coins used in payment for supplies left at the boundaries. Because this is boundary at Parish, obviously. This is the boundary of the parish, so supplies would have been left here, the money would have been left in the stone. So that's the idea of the stone. Right, I'm Colin the Head. Thank you for watching Colin the Head's Build of Everything, and I hope to see you again in another show. Bye! Colin the Head's Build of Everything.